welcome everyone and thank you for coming out today. Um, today we're here to welcome Peter Beck. Um, he's coming to us from the U.S. Committee on Human Rights in North Korea. He's the director there. Um, his involvement with the issue in North Korean human rights has been uh, immense. Um, he's been involved on the United States side and also looking working in North Korea. Um, uh, today he's not only working on the Human Rights in North Korea project, but he's working as a columnist for the weekly Shozun and the Korea Herald. And prior to joining um, the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, he worked in the International Crisis Group's North Korea Asia, Pro Asia Project in Seoul and was the Director of Research and Academic Affairs at the Korea Economic Institute in Washington, D.C. from 1997 to 2000. Um, he's also served as a ministry as a member of the Ministry of Unification Policy Advisory Committee in 2005 through 2007, and as an adjunct faculty member at American University, Iwa, Georgetown, and Yonsei Universities. Um, after that, he's, or before that, he's also worked as a translator for the Korea Foundation, a staff assistant for Korea National Assembly, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, <laughs> and I won't talk to you anymore. Um, Thank you so much for coming, and welcome Peter back. Thank you very much, Alexis. It's really a pleasure to be here. I have to say that uh, I think this is my second trip to Vermont, and when I came before, I um, had a program, I think in Massachusetts, and I drove up to Burlington, and I have to say I, I passed by Middlebury without stopping. I didn't have time to stop, and I uh, regretted it, and uh, I'm glad that I finally have the chance to come here and I really want to thank you for letting me uh, appreciate your little corner of paradise. I um, intentionally took the early flight today so that I could go hiking this afternoon and I went up uh, Mount Abraham, uh, which I guess is not too far from here. It's far if you don't know your way around the countryside and so I got profoundly lost. But uh, it's truly beautiful, and I, I don't think you could have timed this your, your Korea week better in terms of fall foliage. Um, just spectacular, and I'm really thinking about finding a way to move up here if I if I can convince my family and find a job. Um, this is probably my craziest week of the year. Uh, yesterday afternoon, at about this time, I was swimming in the Atlantic Ocean in Florida. And I had just finished four hours of lectures uh, for the Air Force uh, Special Operations School. Uh, tomorrow I'm hosting a roundtable in Washington with a reverend uh, who has operated uh, the Underground Railroad that we'll talk about today. And then tomorrow night I'm getting on a plane and going to Iowa for a conference uh, that starts Friday morning. So this is the second out of four programs in totally different cities. Um, so the, the nights have been short and the days have been long, but uh, it's really, uh, I guess I'm still young enough that I can uh, have a crazy schedule once in a while. Um, but I'm glad I'm not doing this every week, but um, it, it really is a, a pleasure to be here. I was uh, uh, in Seoul for three years working for the International Crisis Group, uh, monitoring North Korea, mostly working on security issues, uh, focusing primarily on the North Korean nuclear issue. And, if you didn't have enough uh, discussion yesterday with David, I'd be happy to talk uh, more today. Um, but uh, I found I was lecturing quite frequently in Seoul and teaching uh, at a couple of places, and uh, I found that Koreans were overwhelmingly, young and old, indifferent about North Korea. There are some people that care, but for most people, they really don't care if people are starving, if uh, the North is launching missiles or testing nukes. Uh, people really don't seem to care. And I told my uh, students and uh, my audiences that, uh, you know, you're Koreans. If you don't care about North Korea, who will? And, uh, but I told them, and I'll, and I'll tell you, I, and I know that by coming here today after you've had a, a long day of school, it tells me that you're not average uh, American students, that you care about the world. And I told my students in Korea that um, I would not tell you what to care about, what, what country or what region, and even when it comes to North Korea. I will not tell you that you must focus on North Korean human rights or you must focus on the humanitarian issue and, and famine relief. Uh, all I ask is that you care and that, um, you know, we can't, not all of us can devote our lives to doing these things, but at least be informed about to the extent that we can get information about what's happening in North Korea. Um, and try to be involved uh, or at least pick 
a country or an issue that you're, that you're concerned about. I was just out at Berkeley a couple of weeks ago where I went to school. And uh, even by the 80s when I was going to school there, uh, student, the student movement had really gotten quite weak. And now it's really non-existent. And um, I guess that's okay. But I, I hope that doesn't mean that you've become apathetic and apolitical. I'm outraged by a lot of things that I see going on in the world, and particularly what's being done by the Bush administration. And uh, if our universities aren't going to be outraged and, and show concern, then I don't think we can expect anyone else to, certainly not people who are uh, too busy uh, working their jobs to, uh, to have time to care about the world. So please, uh, get involved. Um, and again, coming here, I think, shows me that you're involved, but try to get your classmates involved as well. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you today about is the, the work uh, that we're doing, uh, the work that I started in Seoul. Um, working on North Korea is very, very, doing field work is very, very difficult. And when I was working for the International Crisis Group, I was based in Seoul, but I was able to visit uh, the North four times. But every time I visited the North, I felt like I was, um, as they would say in Korean, licking the skin of a watermelon. Um, it's not very satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I was there, but I really didn't get to experience the place. I really didn't get to have any heart-to-heart -heart conversations with people. I was always, almost always being watched or followed or had someone with me. Um, it really is a police state uh, in many ways, uh, and uh, it's the most frustrating place that I've ever been to. And I've been to some pretty horrible places like Burma last year, Uzbekistan, Laos, um, some pretty nasty regimes, uh, but nothing compares to the regime in North Korea. The level of control that they have over their own people and the level of control that they have over foreigners visiting. Uh, is, is really unprecedented, and the, the level of ideo uh, ideological indoctrination has also been taken to a level that I think the world has rarely seen. And so I really couldn't tell if people I met really believed what they were saying or they were pretending to believe uh, what they were saying to survive. And we won't know until the, the regime collapses uh, what, uh, you know, who were the true believers there were some people I met that seemed pretty normal, that I could almost, I thought I, I could see myself being friends with them if I had regular interactions. Um, unless, except if I talked about political issues, or uh, then, of course, the, uh, the ideology kicked in. Whereas in Eastern Europe, before the wall came down, or in, even in Burma, I met a monk that said, we hate the regime, and we want it to go away. And I'd just been talking with him for five or ten minutes, and I told him, you know, you have Aung San Suu Kyi, you have Buddhism, you have, you have so much more than North Korea has for organizing. But he said, yes, but the government has the guns. And as we saw in recent weeks, uh, those with the guns uh, tend to make the rules. Uh, and it's, as long as Kim Jong-il can maintain control over his military, uh, it'll be very difficult for, for us to see change in North Korea. And so I, I tell people when I moved from uh, the International Crisis Group to, um, to the committee, that I went from working on a frustrating issue, the nuclear issue, to an even more frustrating issue, the human rights issue. And um, our, our most famous report was published a few years ago, uh, and it's called The Hidden Gulag, and it's, um, try, it's exposing North Korea's uh, prison camps. And uh, this was a, a very long study that we did, combining satellite imagery with uh, testimony from uh, North Korean refugees and defectors. Um, we have now more than 10,000 North Koreans who have defected uh, to primarily to the south, but does anyone know how many North Koreans have come to the United States in the last few years? About 30. About 30 North Koreans have come to the U.S., and about 10,000 have arrived in Seoul, most in the last five years. Um, it's still a small number compared to the 50 million uh, South Koreans or the 22, 23 million North Koreans. It's a very small number. But, um, but it's a growing number, it's growing rapidly, and it gives us a, a, source of, a new source of, an expanding source of information about what's going on in North Korea. The problem is that we often don't know who we can believe. And so we tried to use satellite imagery to kind of uh, compare what the stories we were hearing to try and match what they were telling us with the, the features of the land and the buildings because many defectors have learned that they don't have many marketable resources when they come to the South. 
Uh, and one of the only resources they have is the information that they have from when they were in the North. Um, and so some have learned to um, become very good fiction writers and pass it off as, uh, as nonfiction. And because we, we don't have people on the ground in North Korea who can independently check these things, you know, we, we often have no way of confirming uh, whether or not what they tell us is true. So that makes it very difficult uh, for doing work on North Korea. And so often, you know, no matter what the subject was, but particularly when it comes to, say, the prison camps that the North has, we were doing work on the North Korean economy. I mean, that seems pretty non-controversial and non-threatening to the regime, but even on a sim seemingly benign subject like the North Korean economy, ten, talk to ten people, they'll tell you ten different stories about what's happening to the North Korean economy. Um, you know, the, are the reforms that they started five years ago, are they real? Um, uh, what are conditions really like? How much change has taken place? Everyone has a different opinion, and so all you can do is really gather as many opinions as you can, compare them, uh, you know, try and, uh, and, and then try to make a synthesis. Uh, and so this is especially difficult when it's a subject like um, human rights, because this is something that the regime very much wants to try to hide. Um, and so we really, uh, we are very dependent on those who are able to get out. And in some cases, the information we have uh, about the worst camps is, is actually the, the most sketchy because the worst camps are people are least likely to get out. Um, and it's actually the lower security uh, camps, the less horrible camps where people are actually able to escape. The really horrible camps, uh, they're usually not able to. I um, started working on Korea almost exactly 20 years ago when I was an undergraduate, and I was <clears throat> initially working on South Korea, and then gradually began migrating to doing work on, really like David Kong. Uh, if you attended David Kong's talk yesterday, uh, he started working on uh, South Korea and then gradually shifted to North Korea. Um, uh, and then when I was in Seoul, you know, focusing primarily on the nuclear issue, but uh, the report that, that, that I worked on that had the greatest impact on me was a report on North Korean refugees um, called uh, Perilous Journeys, the Plight of North Korean Refugees in China. And three of us spent more than a year working on this report. And um, the International Crisis Group is a security-focused organization. So this uh, report wasn't really a core concern for the uh, organization, but it really touched me to travel around uh, Asia and China and to see uh, North Koreans um, uh, you know, North Korean women primarily, uh, sometimes even behind bars, for example, in the Bangkok Immigration Detention Center, uh, waiting to, uh, to go to South Korea or waiting to go to the United States. Um, that report really had probably more impact on me than um, any of the reports that we worked on. And so when I had this opportunity to, to come back to Washington and to, uh, to change jobs, I, I jumped at this opportunity. But I'm coming from a very large organization that was based in Brussels with offices all over the world to a one-person organization. Uh, so I, I, like, I would tell my friends that uh, the good news is that for the first time in my life I don't have a boss. Uh, the bad news is that I don't have any employees uh, to, to help me. So uh, unfortunately that's often the case, especially with NGOs working on North Korean human rights. Uh, it's uh, most of us that are doing this are, are one-person or two-person uh, organizations. There are very few larger organizations and we're all uh, very poor organizations. And so I've just started with, uh, with the committee uh, a couple of months ago and so um, I'm still looking for, for help actually and so I wanted to issue to you a uh, uh, an opportunity that if you're looking for uh, experience in Washington, uh, I can't promise you much more than a desk in a cubicle, but uh, if you want to work on policy issues and research and uh, uh, helping us put together these reports, um, we, have, we will have positions open uh, next year. Um, so to, to make a note of that. And even if you don't have plans to come to Washington, all you have to do is visit uh, www.hrnk.org to see how humble our website is. Um, and we could really, I could really use help um, just uh, adding content, uh, posting. I, I, I'm going to revamp the website and hopefully change our name to take U.S. out of the name, make it more international. Um, but uh, it's hard doing everything uh, on my own. 
And so, uh, and particularly when I, I, I lack, even though I was born in Silicon Valley, I lack all computer skills <laughs> other than basic uh, word processing. So um, uh, I'm kind of out of my depth in trying to uh, improve um, our website. And I also want to create Korean and Japanese and Chinese and as many languages as possible, mirror sites, even if they're just a summary of our work so that we can better coordinate uh, our activities. Because one of the challenges that we face as NGOs is competition is a good thing, but, uh, but if you don't coordinate your activities and you don't work together both within your country and with other countries, yeah, it makes it more difficult to be effective. You have a lot of duplicated efforts and uh, it uh, uh, you know, makes it that much more difficult to get the world's attention. What, the, what this committee has in common with my old job is, and what I like about uh, the work that I've been able to do for the last few years, uh, is it combines uh, research and advocacy. That um, you know, we try to be good students, and students are actually the biggest consumers of our products. Um, you know, on, our, on both of our the ICG and the HRNK websites, uh, students download our reports more than anyone else. And for me, each of these reports is a learning experience because I didn't know uh, nearly, uh, I only know a small fraction of the information that went into any one report before we wrote it. Um, but then we use that information to try to find creative solutions. Uh, and that's where the NGO part comes in. So both organizations that I've worked for build on the research skills that you're developing here at Middlebury to try and um, delve into issues deeply uh, to know all that we can know. First, we read everything that we can get our hands on uh, to see what information is out there. Then we identify gaps in our knowledge. What do, what do we not know? What would we like to know that we don't already know? Then we find that information, and then based on all the information we gather, we try to make recommendations. And that's the hardest part, um, because there are a lot of smart people uh, working in Washington, working in the State Department, and the problem is that they don't always have a voice, or if they do have a voice, they're not listened to. Um, and so, even if uh, you know we're a very small organization and we're just re and we're essentially reinventing the wheel, we can still provide uh, a voice that that some in the government would like to have, but for various reasons uh, don't have. Um, and so, the challenging part is first is just trying to make sure that you're not going to. Uh, make mistakes, and I'll give you a good example of something we haven't published. There are allegations that North Korea engages in chemical and biological testing on its own people. Um, there are, there are um, eyewitness accounts and uh, supposedly government documents that have been leaked out of the country, but we, for our own, for our own degree of um, satisfaction, are not convinced that these are that these are legitimate documents, so we have not included in any of our reports information about this. Um, but others have, including the BBC and even one of my uh, board members. Um, the committee is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, if you look at our board, it is weighted more towards conservatives than liberals, that's true. But the chair of my board is a conservative, worked in the Reagan administration, and the, the co-chair is, uh, is a, a longtime Democrat member of Congress, uh, Steve Solars from uh, nearby New York. Um, and so what I'm finding is that on the issue of human rights that there's a growing convergence between the left and the right, that the conditions there are pretty horrible. I'm not sure I would have even worked for this committee four or five years ago because when it was created in the early 2000, 2001, it seemed like it was a tool of the right to beat North Korea over the head. But I think over the last four or five years, uh, even liberals like myself have come to realize that, uh, that the situation in North Korea is quite horrible and uh, that we do need to try to take steps uh, to improve it. And so when I just had my first board meeting a couple of weeks ago, and um, I felt like I was taking my comprehensive exams again, instead of, but instead of having three tormentors uh, grilling me with questions, I had 12 tormentors. Um, but, um, but the default lines on my board were not between liberals and conservatives, but in terms of approaches. You know, should we be out in the streets protesting? Um, should we, or, or should we be, you know, should we be advocating regime change? My, my uh, committee has not been advocating regime change in North Korea, but some of my board members think uh, that we should be advocating regime change. 
There is a, I also have a board member who is a fairly well-known activist, Suzanne Schulte, and she's also a one woman. She's a one woman NGO, but she organizes demonstrations at, uh, primarily at the Chinese embassies uh, in Washington and consulates around the U.S. And her next big demonstration is uh, November 30th and uh, December 1st. She's having a worldwide um, protest against the Chinese government. And she's trying to form coalitions, not just people concerned about North Korea, but Tibetans, Uyghurs, uh, Falun Gong, uh, democracy activists. There are a long list of very oppressed groups in China. Uh, and each of those groups tend to work in isolation. And so she is working on the activist side, uh, trying to get people in the streets to beat their drums and to show their displeasure with China. Um, but it's hard to find an effective strategy. Um, I call it, you know, there's a high-low approach. It's often good for jobs, you know, if you know, or your parents or your uh, senior people, professors know someone of their level, then it can be very helpful for uh, getting your foot in the door, but it's also good to know people at the working level. Um, and similarly, the high-low approach for trying to affect change is also um, uh, I think it's good to have a combination. The high approach is to focus on government officials, to try to meet with people in the Bush administration. Uh, are any of you familiar with LINK? Uh, do they have a chapter here? No. Yeah, as far as I know, they, um, I just met the head of LINK, Adrian Hong, who um, went to Yale and started LINK about three years ago. They've closed all their chapters, basically. Um, and he's decided that the low approach of organizing people at the campus level, they had at one time a year or two ago more than 100 chapters, um, but he has concluded that um, you know, they, were, they were overwhelmed. There were so many chapters that they really couldn't uh, organize them uh, or make them very effective. Um, and he decided to move his office to Washington, D.C. They've just opened an office uh, a few weeks ago. Um, near my office in, in D.C. They've decided that instead of focusing on the street level of, of getting people to march uh, and attend rallies and awareness sessions, that he would focus on, on uh, trying to reach government officials and, uh, and other NGOs in Washington. Um, so you can see that Link it, itself, is, uh, uh, Liberty in North Korea, has been transform is transforming itself from an activist NGO to more of a advocacy NGO. Um, and my NGO is, again, a combination of research and advocacy, um, and we try to, uh, to work with everyone uh, in Washington. Um, what I thought I would focus on is the work that I started uh, when I was with uh, the International Crisis Group uh, and have been uh, continuing um, uh, for the committee on, on North Korean refugees, uh, and particularly uh, North Korean women, since that is overwhelmingly the, the group uh, that is going to, uh, that's trying to leave. Um, again, the, the, some of this is based on a report that was published. If you, you can visit icg.org to, to find uh, this report on refugees or any of the other reports that we've done on, on North Korea. And same with hrnk.org, all our reports are available there. But what we tried to look at was what are the push and pull factors that lead uh, people to want to leave North Korea? I mean, you know, the North Korean government. Oh, I wanted to show you, um, since, I, I have, since I didn't bring a high-tech PowerPoint demonstration, I wanted to show you uh, some, uh, some souvenirs that I have from North Korea, um, money and stamps. I'm, uh, one of the titles I don't uh, brag about too much is I'm president of the Korea Stamp Society here in the U.S. So I'm a stamp geek. I'm a philatelist geek. Um, but North Korea makes some pretty interesting things. And given how little information we have about North Korea, the stamps, I think, give you a very small window, maybe no larger than a stamp, but at least a small window on North Korea, uh, how the regime sees itself, uh, if nothing else. And on the first page, I've put two of my uh, favorite stamps. One, um, actually, the stamp says Yankee SOB. And it shows a, it shows a, uh, a North Korean civilian striking an American soldier. And I, I show this to South Koreans, and they, their eyes get wide. The North Koreans put this on a stamp? <laughs> um, 
Yes. Uh, that shows you the level of indoctrination that has taken place in North Korea. It's so bad that the way that North Koreans in everyday conversation, even with small children, the way they refer to Americans is American imperialist SOB. That is, and so that's how I introduced myself to, to North Koreans. I say, 안녕하십니까, 미제놈입니다. Uh, and 미제놈 is, um, uh, is American imperialist SOB. And, uh, and I did that to, to, you know, just to kind of see what kind of a reaction I would get from North Koreans. Uh, and some would be kind of shocked, what did he just say? And some would, uh, some would laugh. And a couple of people actually said, said no, 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 you're just an American imperialist. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, you know, I, I made a point of trying to say this to everyone that I could to, to see if maybe for a few people at least they would realize the absurdity of, of, uh, of the, uh, the rhetoric that they use. So that stamp's on the first page. And then uh, there's a stamp that I never thought I would see that was issued in 2000 for the, for the North-South Summit. And when Kim Dae-jung, the, the, I call this the $500 million handshake uh, because that's how much cash went to the North for this summit and the, uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and not to say that every North Korean saw or got to use this stamp, but I still thought I'd, I'd ne would never see a, a South Korean leader appear on a, a stamp. Uh, and some, some interesting images. Uh, junior as statesman. Junior uh, with daddy. Uh, that's where his legitimacy comes from. Junior as administrator. There are some junior as a heroic figure, if you can believe such a thing. But there's some, some, some interesting, and, and junior with the military, very, you know, which is very important. So I'll uh, show this to you. I can put it on the picture, so it's showing on the but screen. But these are to? No, yeah, I can, it's in this one, right here. It's this camera. Oh. It's left to me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we might have a little slideshow after all. Um, you can be selective. I don't want to put people to sleep <laughs> looking at stamps. Uh, works too effectively with my wife. Um, but um, so it's basically impossible to do work in North Korea. And so I convinced um, the International Crisis Group headquarters in Brussels to um, allow us to do work on North Korean refugees because we can go to China. We can go to, we, I traveled all over the region going from Mongolia to Burma and uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, everywhere, ev everywhere that North Korean uh, refugees go. Uh, we went to try and look at this, the conditions that they face. Uh, what are the push factors? What are the pull factors that lead people to leave what the North Korean government would like us to believe is the worker's paradise? The push factors initially started with the famine. Uh, in the, the mid-1990s when, uh, when famine swept North Korea. Um, but over time, as the famine has subsided, there's still hunger, but we don't think there's widespread famine. The World Food Program is active uh, in North Korea, as are some other NGOs. Um, we know there's hunger, but we don't think there's widespread famine. The, the biggest push factor has been the, the lack of economic opportunity uh, in North Korea, that factories have closed, people are, are, are just barely surviving. And um, even though markets have, have taken place, many people are not, uh, don't have anything to sell. Um, and so the markets are only partially effective in, in helping uh, restructure the economy. So people, North Koreans are leaving primarily not to defect. The average North Korean who crosses the Yalu River, and by the way, the Yalu and the Tumen Rivers that separate China from North Korea, uh, the Yalu is fairly wide and, and, uh, and deep. Wow. <laughs> this is the Aridang Festival that, um, these are, uh, th this is the festival that President No was taken to. It's really grotesque. You have tens of thousands of North Korean children and young people um, doing, uh, you know, I went to Berkeley and we used to have a card section where, you know, about f uh, a couple hundred drunk students would, were supposed to hold up colored cards to do pictures for the alumni sitting on the other side. <laughs> well, the North Koreans have taken this to a whole new level. Um, they get five, ten thousand people sitting in the stands doing more than a hundred different elaborate card tricks, some uh, card flipping some involving elaborate um, animation even, you know, you know, people turning them at just the right moment so you have something moving across the screen. 
Um, it's a propaganda display and um, where you have 40, 50,000 people. Um, your eyes just cannot take in all the movement. You've got the card section in the back and then you've got thousands of people on the field doing all kinds of different um, performances all to, you know, to try and provide legitimacy for the regime, to show the North Korean people in the world that even this morally bankrupt, economically bankrupt regime is still strong. It can, and, and so uh, the North Koreans would ask me, so are you impressed? Are you impressed with, um, you know, are, were you impressed with the show? I said, well, yeah, it was, it was impressive, but I said it was also frightening. Why was it frightening? Well, I mean, to see, you know, to, to get 50,000 people that all do the same thing, it's kind of scary. I don't think any other country in the world has ever done this. And they said, well, how do you know, how do you know that we're really scary people? I said, trust me, I married a Korean woman. I know um, <laughs> how scary they can be. So that would, that would get them to be quiet. But um, uh, Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, was taken to this, uh, to this performance. So, um, and this is the, some of these images that you'll see. Um, there are many faces to North Korea. If you visit Pyongyang, it doesn't look that bad. You don't see soldiers on every corner. People are just going about their daily lives. The buildings don't look too bad. People aren't dressed, often aren't dressed well, but they don't look especially hungry. They don't look especially unhappy. And it was finally breaking out of the hotel one evening. The British ambassador helped me escape from the hotel. And I said, well, what, do I t what, what happens? I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to blend in on the streets of Pyongyang if you know, police or the military stop me. What am I going to do? So we'll just tell them in Korean, you live here, and it'll be too much trouble for them to figure out whether, where you, whether you do or, or not. So sure enough, um, no one even said anything. So I, I got to spend one evening wandering around Pyongyang. But it just struck me how ordinary uh, everything felt and talking to street vendors and watching life on the street. So even without your minder wandering around Pyongyang, um, this is Daddy. Uh, this is Kim, Kim Il-sung. Uh, various uh, phases of his life, um, founder of the regime. Um, you know, so again, just wandering around Pyongyang, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily, even as a Korean speaker, you wouldn't necessarily get the sense that, oh, this is a horrible place. But if you go out into the countryside and the farther you get from Pyongyang, the, the more difficult the conditions get. Uh, and that's not so easy to do. Um, and, of course, these prison camps are completely off limits to, uh, to outsiders. So we really, and up to 200,000 people are in these camps um, out of the, the 22, 23 million North Korean population. Um, and so we really don't have an accurate, uh, you know, we, we get these different images of North Korea, um, images that the regime wants us to see. Um, and even images that they don't want us to see, it's hard to make sense of it all. So we decided that we would talk to North Koreans in China. And um, again, the biggest push factor has been economic opportunity. And so mo most North Koreans are leaving not with the intention of defecting, but okay, I'll make some money, get some food, and then go back. But what they discover by going to China, that is an act of betrayal for the North Korean regime, and they are committing a crime. And the punishment can vary from a few days of re-education. It can vary from a few days of, uh, is there, can I choose a couple of images to show? Um, the one that I mentioned, uh, he's on the first, on the first, these two. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's <laughs> Um, so, there, so by leaving uh, North Korea, they are committing a crime. And so, depending, and depending on what they're doing in China uh, determines, or what they're caught doing, or what they're alleged to be doing in North Korea. That's the, the stamp on the right there of Yankee, Yankee SOB. <laughs> and that's the one uh, from the summit in 2000. I haven't checked if North Korea has issued a stamp for the 2007 summit that, uh, that took place last week. Um, so many are deciding once they get to China that it's too dangerous for them to go back to North Korea, and then they make a decision to defect. The biggest pull factor that pulls people out of North Korea are family members who have already defected. Um, if you have a family member that's gotten out, uh, then they can earn money in South Korea or if they're living in a third country, and they can send that. The border with North Korea is very porous on the eastern side. 
the river is very shallow and you can wade across or even walk across it. The water didn't even go to my knees um, when I was there uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there are guards posted regularly, but at night it's fairly easy to cross the border. And so people are crossing the border quite regularly, legally and illegally. And those with, uh, those with family members who have gotten out can get money and get information smuggled back to them. All you really need is a few thousand dollars and a telephone number of the right person to contact when you arrive in China. And you just bribe, you bribe people along the way, whether it's alcohol or cigarettes or cash. Uh, there's a going rate for, the, you know, for, for, uh, for traffic police, for security people, and you just make sure you have enough money to keep paying all the bribes, and you're out. So, you know, money talks more than ideology uh, in North Korea for, for, uh, in many cases. Um, and so that makes it very easy. You can actually get from your hometown in North Korea to Seoul in less than a week if you have enough money. If you don't have money, then you are uh, forced to rely on help from missionaries, and they're primarily South Korean and ethnic Korean, Chinese, Korean American uh, missionaries who are going to China to, to try and help um, North Koreans. And that process can take a long time. It can take one, two, or, or three or more years to get out, um, depending on the woman's situation. The main obstacle is not North Korea, it's China. Uh, China does not allow uh, North Koreans to freely go back and forth unless they have official permission. If they don't, they consider them illegal migrants. They will round them up and ship them back. Um, and that's when North Koreans uh, face uh, punishment. So China has taken a very uh, harsh policy, particularly in the lead up to the Olympics. And they've been cracking down on missionaries and kicking them out of the country as well. So four or five years ago, if you went to the border area of China with North Korea, you could see street children, uh, North Korean street children who were begging. They're gone. Uh, they had to go into hiding or they had to go back because the, the Chinese rounded them up and sent them back. So it's very difficult to even know how many North Koreans are in China at every, any given time. We think that maybe two or 300,000 went um, in the mid to late 1990s, but the bottom line is no one really knows how many North Koreans are in China. And so the North Koreans themselves are constantly playing a cat and mouse game uh, with, the, the North Korean, with the North Korean regime who have security people there and Chinese authorities trying to stay in hiding, staying in safe houses um, so that they don't get, um, uh, so they don't get sent back. And these are overwhelmingly women. Now why do you think it is that women, why is it that three Three you know, three, by a three or four to one margin, uh, refugees in China are women. Why aren't more men leaving? Yes. Men are in the military. That's, you have a million strong military, so many of the men are in the military. That's, that's one thing. Yeah, women are, uh, women are the merchants in North Korea. Um, and so when you go to the markets, it's primarily women that are selling things. So many of the people that are going to China are women who are acting as peddlers or merchants. Um, that's one source of, of, uh, of people going back and forth. Another is, you know, unfortunately, one of, the thing, one of the things that women have to sell if they have nothing else is themselves. And so willingly or unwillingly, women are, uh, are being sold, are being trafficked in China. Uh, we think about two-thirds of all women that go to China get trafficked in one form or another. A best-case scenario is that a family friend um, or a relative introduces the woman to an ethnic Korean uh, who's looking for a, uh, looking for a wife, um, and they can have sort of an arranged marriage, if you will. Um, that's a best case scenario, but more typically they're sold um, either into prostitution or sold to, to Chinese men who are needing brides. And in some cases, the brokers that are doing this are, are telling the women, well, just go there for a few days or a week, uh, we'll collect the money and then, you know, we'll help you escape. And so they'll sell them and resell them to these, uh, to these Chinese men. Now, even in the best case scenario, even if a North Korean woman willingly marries someone, she is still staying in China illegally and can be, can be deported at any time if she's reported by anyone in the community. So 
even when they are living in a consensual uh, relationship, uh, mutually consensual relationship, um, they still live in fear of being sent back to, to North Korea, even if they've started a family. Um, and so that's another problem that we've been trying to push the North Korean government, uh, the South, I'm sorry, the Chinese government to pursue is to allow uh, North Koreans to stay in China if they've, if they've entered into lawful um, and legitimate marriages. Uh, but even that, the Chinese government is not showing a lot of flexibility uh, or very little flexibility. And so these women are living in hiding. And so for the last two years, we've had three years actually, we've had a, I've had a research team uh, for the committee that's been going back and forth to the region to find these women living in hiding. Uh, and so we've uh, interviewed 77 of them uh, over the lab, very uh, extensive, sometimes multiple interviews, often in their homes uh, with their husbands present to, to, for them to be confident that nothing uh, bad was going to happen. Um, but, but again, it's taken almost three years to, to reach a sample of less than 100, and, and even after these three years, we really don't know how many people are there. Uh, but this will be one of the first uh, intensive studies that looks at the, the, condition that, the conditions that these women are facing um, and, and will give us a better picture of, uh, of, of what conditions are like for them in China. Uh, I, I think I'm running out of time, and I want to make sure that um, you can ask questions on uh, any and all subjects. So I'll just um, um, talk to you a little bit about the previous report that we published. What happens after China? So China is not a stable uh, place for Chinese for North Koreans to go. So they can, they some are in hiding, um, starting families in hiding, hoping that they don't get reported. Uh, but there are two ways. Um, there are two ways out of China, and one is what I call through the front door of going to a, a, an embassy or consulate uh, and um, taking refuge there, but that's risky because uh, some get caught. Uh, sometimes the Chinese authorities are lenient, um, sometimes they're not, but often they'll pretend to be, the North Koreans will pretend to be South Koreans, they might even have fake documents, show their fake documents, walk into a, an embassy and, and defect. Um, but again, that's taking a risk. Uh, but that's the easy way if they actually make it in. The harder way uh, is actually more common, and that is, that, and there are two routes basically. That they, there's a northern route to Mongolia and the southern route to Southeast Asia. This journey uh, is a journey that can take up to 5,000 miles um, with a combination of buses, cars, uh, trains. Uh, again, playing a cat and mouse game uh, with Chinese authorities. Once they, once they reach Mongolia, they're safe. There's, there's a problem, though, with Mongolia in that they have a Gobi Desert. And so people die out in the desert. Um, it's very dangerous. But the Mongolian government is very brave. Um, they are standing up to the Chinese and the North Koreans. They're friends with both countries. They don't really like the Chinese, uh, given their, their history. They're like the Vietnamese. They, they don't trust the Chinese and don't particularly like them. Um, so they've decided that they're going to stand up to China and not allow North Koreans to be repatriated. But the problem is, one, getting to Mongolia and then surviving uh, the crossing in the Gobi Desert, because often they have to go far out. It's really like the U.S.-Mexico border in some ways, that uh, the crossing points are very well patrolled, but then the farther out you go into the desert, the less patrolling there is and the easier it is to cross, but the more risk you're taking uh, of succumbing to the elements. So there's the northern route um, uh, that, that's problematic because of, of, of the desert. And then the southern route is problematic because all of the countries that border China don't like having North Koreans come in. You have Burma, Laos, and Vietnam. Those are the three choices. You have to go through one of those three countries. Laos is an ally of North Korea. Burma were, and North Korea were allies until the North uh, did a bombing there in 1983 that um, upset the Burmese and they closed down their North Korean mission. Uh, and Vietnam is good friends with North Korea. Um, so all of those countries uh, do not have a friendly attitude towards uh, North Koreans. But often it's too much trouble and too much expense for them, even though they're sympathetic to North Korea, it's too much trouble and too costly for them to actually send the North Koreans back to North Korea all the way across China. So often they will let them out or they will hold them hostage for um, ransom. Um, once they reach uh, Cambodia and especially Thailand, then they're essentially safe. But again, to reach Thailand, to, to get from North Korea to Thailand is a very long journey. 
um, and, and not, for the, uh, not for the weak. Um, but that's the level of determination that's needed for most North Koreans uh, to get out. Uh, I, when I left Seoul, we were also finishing a report. I'll just uh, finally mention a, a report that we were finishing on um, what happens to North Koreans after they leave, uh, because the vast majority of North Koreans don't, re, uh, don't uh, settle very successfully into South Korea. They have trouble getting jobs. Uh, they're discriminated against. Uh, South Koreans don't like them by and large because they think, A, they might be a spy, or B, they're really weird. They're different than us. They don't, under, you know, they don't understand a lot of the words, that, especially loan words from English that Koreans use are difficult uh, for North Koreans to understand. So by and large, they're, they have a very difficult life in South Korea. Um, and so um, that was also a, a report that we published last year on North, Koreans, um, uh, North Korean refugees. We had one chapter on the resettlement process in that report, A Bitter Taste of Paradise, by a good friend of mine, Andrei Lonkov. So even once they reach uh, freedom, security, uh, safety, they struggle. Uh, part of it is the level of indoctrination that they've had in North Korea, and part of it is the often not so receptive re um, uh, population that they deal with. Um, even after they've made all of those struggles to leave North Korea, then they struggle to be integrated and uh, assimilated into South Korean society. Um, I think I've run out of time, and uh, sorry for going on for so long, but I uh, welcome your questions on any subject that I've talked about, not talked about. We can talk presidential election, six-party talks, uh, North Koreans, South Koreans, you name it. I'm happy to talk about it. So fire away. Give, give me your best shot. So maybe you could explain other stamps. <laughs> um, this is, uh, who is, who is Junior meeting with here? Putin. Uh, stamps with, anyone know who that is? Boizumi. Quite a dashing, dashing individual. I, I was living in Seoul and I uh, got to meet him last year before he left office uh, at his residence. Uh, I was part of a big group that he was uh, giving some welcoming remarks to, and after his remarks, he walked up to me, and, uh, and, and I, w I wanted to tell him, please don't go to Yasukuni Shrine. But his first words were to me were, do you play basketball <laughs> in English? And totally threw me off guard, and I lost, <laughs> lost the courage to, uh, so much for speaking truth to power. Uh, Zhang Jimin, another good friend, former uh, Chinese premier, uh, who's in Tao. This is uh, part of his uh, previous v visit. Um, what else did I want to show you? This is part of his, th these stamps are from his unofficial visit to, to China last year uh, when he made an unannounced uh, unofficial trip. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the first mountain climber to uh, scale a mountain in loafers. And um, you know, striking a very heroic pose. Um, this is Mount Baekdu, which all Koreans revere. It is really spectacular. It's on the China China North Korea border. This is his mother and father fighting it out in the wilderness <laughs> sixty years ago, seventy or more than more than sixty years ago. Um, the military. All important. Lots and lots of military stamps. All right, I'll, I'll stop torturing you with stamps. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, is it common, or okay? Well, is it common for women ever to cross or to leave North Korea with their children? Or if they're married women, to leave at all? Good question. Um, are families leaving? Uh, yes. Um, typically, they're leaving without their families, but some do. Often, they travel separately because it looks more suspicious for a whole family to be crossing um, into China. So typically, um, the children will go first and the parents will go later or vice versa. It sort of depends on the family. 
Um, so yes, whole families are leaving, but they're the minority. It tends to be uh, single people. And so one of the issues has been, uh, that's only recently been resolved is, well, if someone, a married person leaves North Korea alone, what is the status of their marriage in South Korea? And the Korean courts just ruled that they could declare themselves to be divorced uh, unilaterally uh, just by leaving North Korea. But this has been a very thorny issue. I was just wondering, you said sometimes they go into the embassies and they get sort of um, a safety net there. What happens to them after that? Do they go to the country of the embassies where they sort of visit it? And what's the integration process after that? Good question. Most um, are quietly um, going through the South Korean embassy or consulate, so that's pretty straightforward. When they enter uh, a third country's uh, embassy, and that happens from time to time, these are typically called embassy incursions, the host embassy is not very happy about this, uh, first of all, because it means their diplomats suddenly have to be uh, you know, motel workers um, to take care of um, unexpected visitors. And so the U.S. consulate in Shenyang, for example, had to convert a gymnasium into a uh, a dormitory when uh, North Koreans managed to scale the wall of the U.S. consulate in, in Shenyang. Um, and so that, um, no government wants them to take this route. But then um, the host government of the embassy will, uh, will screen them and then ask them to, you know, to what they want to do. And most say, most overwhelmingly say that they want to go to South Korea. So then, uh, so then the, the embassy is working with the South Korean government to have their people come and screen them. They have a screening process because, um, one, they're trying to screen out spies, but they're also trying to screen out ethnic Korean Chinese who want, might want to pretend to be defectors so that they can get better terms for living in South Korea than, than would an ordinary ethnic Chinese. Because Koreans distinguish between Koreans who are born in the U.S. or living in the U.S. and those who live in China for example. Those who live in China are, are of a lower status than those who live in the United States. And so those in China have very restrict, tight restrictions on their ability to go to South Korea, whereas a defector can go instantly uh, to South Korea. So um, there's about a one to two month screening process that they go through, um, and usually closer to two months if they break into an embassy. And this is happening not only in Beijing and other Chinese cities, but in Hanoi as well. There was an incursion, I think, in the Thai embassy just um, just a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, yesterday also, the issue of Burma came up. So if you have to make distinction between the Burmese regime and uh, Korean regime, what would it be? What are, what is, what are the differences? Um, I think Burma is useful for comparing North Korea for several reasons. Um, one, uh, you know, th these are both horrible regimes that, um, that treat their people very badly. Um, but, you know, I often say that were Kim Jong-il to suddenly die, uh, what would happen to North Korea? Uh, my quick answer is that they would become a Burma. Um, that you would have a military coup uh, or military push and the military would take over and that a, hunt, a junta would take over, similar to what we have in Burma. Um, Kim Jong-il has three sons. Uh, the eldest one uh, was caught trying to visit the Tokyo Disneyland uh, a few years ago and has been living uh, the life of a playboy in uh, Macau. Uh, son number two, the only images we have of him are skiing in Switzerland and chasing Eric Clapton around Europe. Um, neither of these sons, uh, they're young, and neither of them seem like they're potential presidential material um, or leader. They don't, are not exactly demonstrating leadership material. So um, that has to be, you know, Kim Jong-il's overwhelming concern is how do I stay in power? Um, regime survival, and how do I pass that power on? How do I keep that power in my family? Uh, and that's the biggest challenge that he faces right now. Um, and I don't think he has, he has a brother-in-law, his wife's husband, um, who um, he's very close to, uh, but h h this brother-in-law doesn't have any ties to the military. So it's not clear that there is any family member that could um, effectively control the country uh, were Kim, Kim Jong-il to die in the next few years. So that leaves a military junta. Um, 
But one thing that North Korea has learned from Burma, from Iraq, uh, and other countries is that uh, the more lethal that you become, the more respect the U.S. will show for you. Um, that they, their nuclear program, if they didn't have the ability to destroy Seoul and their neighbors, uh, or to do serious damage to their neighbors, they would be isolated and ignored, or bombed, or both. Um, by the U.S. Um, but because they are so dangerous, uh, not only their ability to destroy their neighbors, but to export missiles, export nukes, uh, we can't ignore them. And so they are the masters of uh, brinkmanship and the masters of blackmail. Uh, and so the lesson they learned from Burma is if we don't, if we're not threatening, if we're not doing something threatening, then life would get really bad. Uh, and by, you know, look, for five, for over five years, the Bush administration was engaged in name calling and flailing around with North Korea. They test a nuke and all of a sudden the Bush administration said, let's talk. Bilateral talks, okay. You know, we're, we're ready to talk. They only said that after the North tested. Same thing happened under the Clinton administration. Every time they engage in bad behavior, it gets Washington's attention and it gets them new negotiations and gets them new goodies. Um, and so we'll see, uh, we'll see hopefully by the end of this year how serious they are about giving up their nuclear program. But the bottom line is we don't know if it's an insurance policy or, uh, or a, um, on regime survival or a bargaining chip that they're willing to give away. If they do uh, disable their uh, reactor and give a list of the facilities as they've promised to do by the end of the year, then I will be convinced that they are serious about negotiating. But at the moment, I don't know. Um, but uh, also, Burma is a good illustration of how unilateral sanctions don't work. Uh, and unilateral sanctions have not worked against Burma because China, India, Thailand, democracies and non-democracies alike are not supporting those sanctions and are not even criticizing the regime. Similar with North Korea. China and South Korea would never support, almost never support sanctions against North Korea. So it makes getting tough with North Korea almost impossible when you have countries that are willing to keep doing business with them. Other questions? Yes. Um, are the countries to which these women and families, I guess, defecting, are they putting any pressure on the government, the North Korean government, to tighten their their borders or any, is there any pressure put on the government to keep these people from, from being a burden? Absolutely. We have um, reports from uh, Korean and non-Korean missionaries who have visited the region in the last few months that the Chinese and North Koreans are increasing their border patrols, that they're adding high-tech uh, monitoring, uh, more cameras, um, using laser trip wires in some areas. Um, giving, uh, equipping uh, soldiers at the border with heavier weapons. Um, but these are only sporadic reports. We don't have any really systematic way of knowing, but it's safe to say that, you know, the Chinese and the North Koreans both are doing what they can to try and stop the flow of people. The problem is they, it's like the U.S. Um, the U.S. would like to stop the flow of people from Mexico. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not obsessed with the immigration issue the way many Republicans seem to be. But um, the simple fact is, if, a, if an illegal immigrant can get in through Mexico, why can't an al-Qaeda person? Uh, it's that simple. If they really want to get in, they have an easy way to get in um, through Mexico. So, um, so there are security issues concerned. But the simple fact is, it's an eight, nine hundred mile long border. It would be, it's just too expensive for them to closely monitor the whole border. And so... Um, no matter what they do, there will be a certain degree of porousness. But we are getting reports, especially the Chinese want to em avoid embarrassment in the lead up to the Olympics. And so they're cracking down extra hard now to avoid embarrassment. Because many of these human, many of the activist human rights groups are looking for ways to use the Olympics to embarrass China through demonstrations, um, possibly getting athletes to, to carry protest banners in the, you know, in the opening ceremony. Um, demonstrations in Beijing. Um, you know, Beijing is a really nasty regime. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Um, but the world needs, we, we need their cheap toys and, uh, and products. So the world looks the other way at their human rights violations. 
Um, but there are groups that are, are trying to use the Olympics as an opportunity. In the case of Seoul, the Olympics were awarded to Seoul in 1983 when Seoul was a dictatorship. And they did not deserve to receive the Olympics uh, on, based on their politics. The, the government had actually killed people, massacred people in 1980 in Gwangju. Um, uh, they did not deserve to receive the Olympics. Um, but in hindsight, uh, the Olympics actually served as a catalyst in democratization. Uh, 1987, when you had the student uprising in South Korea. The knee-jerk reaction of the military junta in Seoul was, okay, let's mow them down like we did in 1980. The difference this time was, if we mow them down this time, we'll lose the Olympics. So um, that, I think, entered into the calculations of Seoul's dictators in 1987. Uh, and so uh, human rights groups are, are wondering, how can we use lever the leverage of the Beijing Olympics to try to change uh, China's behavior? We've already seen in Darfur. Um, thanks to Mia Farrow and, uh, you know, and some Hollywood types, uh, um, Steven Spielberg, have put, actually managed to put pressure on the Chinese regime to change their policies in Darfur. Um, now the Chinese scream and holler, no, this is, you know, Olympics are not political, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the reality is that, um, that this is what, that the Olympics work both ways. It works to, to increase the crackdown to try and uh, avoid embarrassing situations. But at the same time, groups are trying to see if there are ways that they can use the Olympics to, to leverage it against China. Other questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about, you talked about the prison camps with 200,000 plus people. Can you talk a little more about um, who is there and what you know about what's going on and hopefully maybe some steps you might have come up with with your NGO as far as how to crack down on those. That is um, the most difficult, the toughest nut to crack of all because they're, they're buried deep inside of North Korea and um, you know, the, the regime doesn't even acknowledge their existence. And so what we have uh, in this report is the, the testimony of dozens of people and then the, the whole, uh, the last 20 pages are satellite images. What you have, what we know from the satellite images and testimony is that these camps are actually entire villages or even small counties that have been converted into camps. There are different levels of camps, um, different levels of security and different levels of, um, of punishment that's being meted out. But basically these are camps where people live and work, whether they're doing farming or, um, or, um, or, or ma more manufacturing work. The offenses can range from, uh, the, 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 the saddest cases of all are those, that Korea has a, a caste system or a system of categorizing people as to loyal, wavering, and enemy class. And those in the enemy class are often put there because of what their ancestors did or what their great grandparents did, you know, Japanese sympathizers. Um, and they will punish up to three generations. And so you have children being born into these camps who know nothing but living in a camp and then reaching, reaching freedom and saying, well, I, I just thought it was normal to, you know, the children learn to you know, internalize uh, the situation that they're given and when they don't know any differently, then they just accept that situation. And so the, the saddest uh, of all is that you have entire families being, um, being sent to these camps. There's a very moving, one of the most notorious camps that we highlight in this report is called Yodok. And I don't know if any of you uh, were aware that this became a musical um, in Seoul that actually perform, was performed here in the US last year. Did anyone hear about the Yodok story? Um, I have it on DVD. It's a, it's a very powerful play, uh, musical with a, 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 um, gallows humor, if you will. It's a very tragic story. I took my whole staff in Seoul to see it um, when I was based in Seoul, but that's, that play was, was produced by North Koreans who have defected, and it's the most vivid picture that we have of, um, of camp life, and um, it's just, um, it's horrible. It's, it's very depressing to, to watch, even with the humor, and um, um, there's one song that still, I can still remember this song, you know, if there is a God in heaven, please do not just bestow your grace on South Korea. Don't forget North Korea. Um, you know, we are people too. You know, where is God's grace um, for our people? 
um, you know, kind of making this plea. And, um, um, but the, you know, and, and so the conditions vary. The most horrible camps have very few people that get out. And so in some ways, uh, I have to liken this to um, the concentration camps that we had uh, under Germany and that we, you know, the world knew that things were going on, could have said, a, should have said more about what was going on in Germany, um, but didn't. Um, but we didn't know the full extent of, um, of Germany's activities with these camps. And similarly, we don't know uh, the full extent of just how bad things are. We don't even have an accurate count. There's somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people in these camps. But again, we don't even have an accurate figure of how many people are in them. Yeah. Um, oh, and in the back. I was wondering about the trafficking of women. I was a little confused because you talked about the trafficking. I thought of families from out of North Korea and finally over to Thailand, not, not Mongolia because they can't live there very well. So, I, But is it the trafficking of women or is it also just family members too? That, you know, I'm sorry. It's, it's, okay. single, it's single women who are, um, who are going to China. Families with money um, can get out fairly quickly if they're not caught. Um, and so the traffic, and, and some families are selling children in China. Um, we have, there are documented cases of that. Um, Do you have a report? Do you have a report on that from your, um, your on, uh, well, the report that we're doing on, on North Korean women will probably be issued in December. Oh. Um, so we haven't, we haven't published that report yet. We can get that on uh, your website? Absolutely. Okay. We have time for one more question. Anyone who hasn't gotten asked a question, please. I guess my question pertains to your reports. What happens? Like, are these reports used in terms of policy making, like U.S. policy making, or? What do these reports achieve? I know it goes onto your website and we read it, and, but in terms of policy making? That's, um, all the hardest questions always come at the end. Um, now I'm new to this committee, so I can't speak with as much authority as I would like about the impact of the committee's reports, because I've only been with them for a couple of months. But um, when I was in Seoul for ICG, we published about 10 reports. And the advantage that we had was that we were in the field. And no other organization competed. There were, I had no competitors in Seoul. There were a couple of academics um, that, you know, would, would speak to the press and write quite prolifically. Andrei Lankov is probably the best example. But he's, a one, he's one individual teaching in Korea who's a very smart individual, but, you know, just one person. So there was no other group or organization doing the kind of reports that ICG was doing. Um, and so that was probably the best leverage that we had for getting people to read our reports. So I remember going to the um, U.S. ambassador's residence when, um, the, when the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, John Negroponte, visited a few months ago. And senior members of the delegation, who I'd never met before, said, Peter, I was reading your report on the way over on the plane. And, you know, it's, it's things like that that kind of give me a shot in the arm that we're reaching the right people. The, uh, the other thing is that ICG has uh, two kinds of offices, field offices like the one I ran in Seoul, and then advocacy offices in Washington, New York, Moscow, London, Brussels. So we have five other offices that their sole purpose is to communicate with officials. New York, why New York? The UN. Um, you know, to, and we're opening an office um, in Beijing. Now, I don't think they're going to get very far in getting the Chinese to listen. They haven't listened to anything we've written so far. But um, each year, um, we're asked to, to um, evaluate. When we make recommendations, then once a year, we're asked how many of your recommendations were implemented. And I probably made, in my three years, somewhere, a total of somewhere between 20, probably 30 or 40 recommendations. Uh, only, only a handful, two or three, were implemented. And I can't say that they were implemented because of what I wrote. Um, common sense prevail. Like, for example, the Bush administration finally talking to, finally negotiating with North Korea. 
was that um, was that because for three years that's what I'd been arguing, but I wasn't the only one arguing that. Um, so it's very hard to prove what kind of impact our reports have. We know that they reach the right people and we know that they don't just throw them away, but what we don't know is then what they do with them or how they, uh, how they use them. Governments don't want to say, well, thanks to the International Crisis Group, we've come up with a great new strategy for dealing with this problem and uh, we'd like to you know, thank them at this time. No government will ever admit that. So frankly, I didn't really have a good measure of, um, of my effectiveness. Um, if you look at ICG's annual report, the two measures that they look at are very imprecise. One is the number of web visitors uh, and you, we, we've seen a, the International Crisis Group now has more than five million visitors a year, up from less than a million, uh, l less than a million um, three or four years ago. Um, media, we call it media mentions. The only thing that I would receive every day from headquarters was where did we appear in the foreign, in the world's media, and they count that every time the ICG name appears somewhere in the media, they would count that um, as a measure of influence. Um, and so I actually led the organization. I have to thank Kim Jong-il if I ever get to meet him because I got to lead the organization in media mentions all three years that I was in Seoul. If they did something provocative like test a weapon, then I would get, I would do 30 or 40 interviews over the next week and an AP, one AP story could be reproduced in three or 400 different newspapers. So shot my numbers up uh, nice and high. So, you know, we can say that our, you know, the number of people downloading our reports is going up dramatically and we can say that the media is relying on these reports for, for uh, knowledge. ICG published a report on how Basra was falling apart, for example, and that got very widely quoted in the media as to, you know, how, thing, how badly things are going even in southern Iraq. Um, but in terms of actually, and so our target audience, we don't have a membership, we don't, um, you know, we're not trying to find members, we're trying to make sure that the right people, we're happy as many people that want to read our reports, the more the better, but the focus of our work, of our advocacy is really is on senior officials. But then, you know, we, we, all, we really can't prove that our, our reports have had any impact. So. That's you know one of the choices that you face as you finish up uh, here at Middlebury is whether you want to work on the inside and not have a voice, uh, but actually influence policy from the inside, or to be as loud and noisy as you want, like me, and be on the outside and have little or no influence, or at least no way of verifying your influence. And you know I won't say which is better. Just like I won't say um, you know focus on human rights or focus on humanitarian assistance. Well, the, my favorite NGO in Korea actually does both. It's called Good Friends. It's a Buddhist organization, and they actually do both. They have separate organizations within their NGO, one that helps North Koreans and another one that tries to monitor human rights. Why make a choice? Uh, I think they're both important. Um, but, you know, but um, I've decided that I prefer having a voice, uh, being able to say what I want to say, is more important than working on the inside quietly suffering while you know the government does the opposite of what you recommend that they do. I know a number of people that quit the Bush administration. We know about Iraq and diplomats quitting over Iraq, but a number also quit over North Korea. But those that didn't quit, including a good friend of mine who's in charge of, of analyzing North Korea for the State Department, he suffered for five or six years, you know, just biting his tongue. Um, but now they're finally listening. And uh, now I think he can sleep a little better at night. And, and uh, uh, But for five or six years, he just had to stick it out. And um, it, sometimes it takes longer, like Cuba. Um, no movement whatsoever. Uh, so um, um, it's hard, uh, whether you work on the inside or the outside. And you, you, I think you just have to decide what, what better suits your abilities and temperament. And if you can't keep your mouth shut, then you don't want to work for a government. If you can just do what you're told and, and know that, uh, you know, do the best work that you can and hope that people will listen and leave it there, then, then uh, you can try that route. So that's advice I'd give from working on the outside. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, Apologize, this is probably one of the hardest weeks of the year for me, but uh, it really feels great. To, this does feel like paradise. Uh, <laughs> and um, 
and don't forget it, that you're in paradise because you might not be here forever. Um, so do what I did today and go to uh, Mount Abraham or one of the beautiful mountains to enjoy the color and, um, and appreciate. Uh, I, I, because I, 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 spent, I can't complain because I, I went to graduate school in San Diego in La Jolla, which is actually uh, um, a very nice area of California. And the weather was never hot and never cold, which thoroughly bored my wife. But um, I could bicycle to school every day of the year. Um, and uh, beautiful beaches. So I, I, I've, I've, I've had my taste of paradise, but, um, but this is particularly nice. So thank you for having me, and um, I hope uh, some of you can, I think uh, if there's a dinner tonight, I hope you can join. And uh, I'm a big microbrewed beer fan, and uh, I'm excited to be, here, be near Otter Creek and Magic Hat. And uh, I have a rule about beer that uh, I even tell my students, if it's the color of urine, don't drink it. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I know Vermont that's some very good beer, so look forward to sampling some before I pass out from uh, exhaustion tonight. So it won't be from the beer, trust me. Thank you very much for having me.